Welcome to the webinar on COVID-19 and drugs in the European neighborhood, lessons learned from Ukraine and Georgia. Before we begin, I would like to underline that this webinar is special for the EMC Day as it's the first one where we start to share experiences of our collaboration with countries outside Europe. This time, we will be looking at Ukraine and Georgia, two countries in the East European neighborhood policy area. The agency actually has a long lasting cooperation with both countries, uh, which is based on the working arrangements. However, since 2019, this cooperation has been strengthened thanks to the EU for monitoring drugs project, which is launched uh, by the funding of the European Union. More information about the project you can also find on our website. So what we will do in this webinar? We will see what has been the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic to people who use drugs and their daily practices in Georgia and Ukraine. And we will also see how this situation has evolved between March and September 2020. And then we will also discuss how these experiences resonate with observations elsewhere in Europe, uh, and what might be the long-term impact on the drug-related health services. It is my pleasure now to present the panel. Today we will hear from Dr. David Otiashvili. He is a director of the Addiction Research Center Alternative Georgia and also Associate Professor of Healthcare at Ilya State University in Tbilisi. Dr. Otiashvili was the initiator of this study uh, which will be presented during the webinar, and he also represents the work of the Georgian Research Group. Dr. Tatiana Kiryazov, the senior research scientist of the Ukrainian Institute of Public Health Policy, will present the work done in Ukraine. Our panelists of discussions will today be Mr. Julien Moral Darlo, director of the French Monitoring Center for Drugs and Drug Addiction and active member also of the EMCDA Retox Network. Ms. Ketevan Zarajasvili, uh, she is the chairperson of National Drug Observatory at the Georgian Ministry of Justice. And this National Drug Observatory is our main institutional partner in Georgia. And last but not least is Ms. Katerina Terich, a specialist at the Viral Hepatitis and Opiate Dependency Department of the Public Health Center of the Ministry of Health of Ukraine. Ms. Terich is also the national coordinator of the opiate substitution treatment program in Ukraine. So now when all the panelists are introduced, I'm very happy to move to Kiev and it is my pleasure to give the floor to Dr. Tatiana Kiryazova to begin the presentation. Good afternoon. We are happy to present the results of our study, Impact of the COVID-19 Epidemic on Drug Markets, Substance Use Patterns and Delivery of Harm Reduction and Treatment Services, which took place in Georgia and Ukraine in March-September 2020. On the second slide, you can see Georgia and Ukraine on the map of Europe, and the next slide shows research teams of both countries, Georgia and Ukraine. The next slide shows the COVID-19 pandemic and how anti-pandemic measures were rolling out in both countries. So you see the similar epidemiological situation in both countries. And regarding response measures, in both countries, strict lockdown took place in March-May 2020, including public transportation closure. And then partial release took place starting in May in the end of May, and then the introduction happened of restrictions in September. The background of drug use in both countries shows that in Georgia, estimated prevalence of people who inject drugs is 2.2%, and most popular opioids are heroin and buprenorphine. Stimulant use is also prevalent, and new Psychoactive substances are on the rise, HIV prevalence being 2.3%. In Ukraine, the prevalence of people who inject drugs is less than in Georgia. Drug scene is dominated by opioids, and historically it was so-called shirka, homemade opioid. More recently, it was substituted 
with illicit methadone on the drug scene. And stimulant use is about 40%, as reported by the study participants. And new psychoactive substances are also on the rise, and HIV prevalence is 10 times higher than in Georgia. The methods of our study, it was prospective cohort study of people who, who use drugs. There were 50 participants in Georgia and 51 participants in Ukraine. And each two weeks, cohort participants filled online questionnaire answering questions about past two weeks, about their drug use, drug availability, and access to services during this period of time. You see, this is, this is shown with green circles. And yellow circles shows monthly conducted in-depth interviews with four key informants in each country. They were physician at OET site, physician at detox clinic, harm reduction provider, and drug user community representative. And to learn more about contexts of the study, we conducted in-depth interviews with the cohort participants twice at two points, three months, at six months point during the study. The next slide shows the results obtained in Ukraine. At the next slide, you see our cohort participant characteristics. And you see that of the all 51 participants, almost one-third were women. The mean age of participants was 38 years old. And mean duration of injecting drug use was 19 years. And all of them had history of injecting drugs. And of all the participants, 44% were unemployed. Slide 9 shows psychoactive substance use during lifetime and within past 12 and 3 months reported by participants of our study. As you can see, there are substances which were rather popular before, but are not used by our cohort anymore, such as heroin, cocaine or LSD. At the same time, some substances such as homemade opioids or pervitin were used widely before, but not during past three months. And the most widely used was illicit methadone. More than 70% of our cohort were currently using this substance. And the main trends, the main trends we saw in this study, which actually aimed to monitor the trends in the drug scene and substance use practices, we see that while the use of other drugs was fluctuating but not significantly, significantly changed, we see that the use of illicit methadone was gradually decreased from the start of the COVID-19 pandemic and the strict lockdown introduction, while the use of medical methadone was abruptly increasing in the first one and a half months and then stayed rather high compared to the pre-COVID times. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And talking about illicit methadone here in this study, we mean the methadone, uh, the synthetic opioid, which is produced in powder or crystals, produced in clandestine laboratories and distributed mostly through stashes or dead drops. And when we talk about medical methadone, we don't mean in this study the methadone from pre-governmental programs. We mean the medication in, in the form of pills distributed through pharmacies, and people get access to this methadone using prescriptions got from the licensed private physicians. And this is important to Keep in mind that until recently, the legislation allowed these private licensed physicians to prescribe methadone and buprenorphine for the so-called detoxification purposes. But in practice, there was no medical supervision, no follow-up for the patients after the prescriptions was issued. And a substantial proportion of these medical methadone obtained by prescriptions from these private providers actually appeared on the black market. Mm -hmm. And you see that the sources of this methadone were mostly stashes, illicit methadone stashes and illicit, I mean, medical methadone, 
these were pharmacies as the main source. And here you can see the perception of changes in excess price and quality of the drug of choice of our participants. And you see that in the beginning of the pandemic, they perceive excess as becoming harder. They thought, they thought that price became more expensive and quality became worse, but with time, during six months of our study, their perception more or less returned to the pre-COVID times. Thank you. And regarding injection risk behavior and harm, harm reduction, you see on the left figure that almost half of the participants didn't use the harm reduction services at all. But those who did, they also perceived that the access to harm reduction programs became worse in the beginning of the pandemic, but then again, it returned to the pre-COVID times. And talking about sources of syringes in the past two weeks, the mostly, I mean, mostly the people bought them in the pharmacy and some got from a, a HR programs. Talking about trends and risk behaviors in the past two weeks, we also see that, keeping in mind that the number of our cohort was 51 person, you see that the trends, I mean, there is some changing variations or fluctuations, but they, are, they were not significant. Thank you. Regarding access to harm reduction services, both uh, key informants and participants, the drug users admitted that in the initial phases of the lockdown, access was reduced, but the programs managed to adapt quickly and reacted flexibly to the situation and resume service provision, mostly increasingly using new modalities like mobile vans uh, going through the cities in all city districts and more widely using outreach services and also providing sanitizers and face masks, which was very appreciated, especially in the beginning of the pandemic. Thank you and access to opioid agonist treatment uh, was described as uh, almost st stopped in the beginning of the pandemic, admission of new patients. Actually, it was not only reduced, but in Kiev city, it was completely unavailable. And you can see on the figure to the left that, the, that more than three quarters of our participants actually did not treat, did not receive treatment for substance use at all. But for those who were receiving OAT services, only several people dropped out. And in the beginning, as I said, the admissions was unavailable. And those people actually who wanted to start OAT treatment in the beginning of the pandemic, they switched to these private physicians to buy prescriptions and to buy medical methadone. But the public health center reacted quickly and issued guidance to allow you to take home doses for OAT patients in March. And as while before the pandemic, about 60% of OAT patients in Kyiv were receiving take home doses of methadone and buprenorphine during the lockdown, the strict lockdown for two and a half months, the almost 100% receiving take home doses and about 80% actually stayed on these doses after the lockdown was finished. Thank you. And to summarize our results, we can say that many people experienced, many people who use drugs experienced reduced access to their drug of choice during the initial stage of lockdown, especially, but for the most, they reported that it was restored after the transportation reopened. And we saw a significant decrease in use of illicit methadone because of access difficulties when the transportation was closed and public gatherings restrictions were in place. And many people who previously used illicit methadone switched to medical methadone obtained by prescription from private physicians and bought from many of them were buying the methadone from the pharmacies for themselves. And many bought 
the pills like resold by their peers or dealers. And this situation did not return to the previous levels, even after the strict lockdown finished, in indicating a sustained change in the drug scene in Ukraine. At least this is what we saw during the six months of the beginning of the pandemic. And harm reduction and OET programs managed to adapt to the rapidly changing situation quickly. And after the less availability in the beginning of the pandemic, they resumed service provision without major interruption. And these are the main lessons learned from our study that should be taken into consideration should the strict lockdown be reintroduced or any other pandemic appear. And thank you very much for your attention. And I'm happy to give the floor to the Dr. David Oteashvili from Georgia. Thank you, Tatiana. Happy to be here and present the results of our study and happy to see so many friends in the audience. Uh, in addition to the results of a similar study that just presented by Tatiana, we also did the monitoring of online, major online drug market for Georgia. So I will also present results of uh, online market monitoring. Sample characteristics, we had 50 individuals Majority were uh, men, uh, mean age was 38, and uh, slightly more than half were employed at baseline. This is the uh, drug use, uh, lifetime and the past year drug use. Uh, no surprises here, cannabis leading alcohol, methamphetamine, heroin, uh, MDMA pretty high. I have to uh, um, say that our sample, we tried to make it pretty um, um, homogeneous. So our seeds, we had eight seeds for recruitment, were representing different subpopulations of uh, people who use drugs, like so-called club drug users, injection users, non-injection, different age groups. So our, our sample was sufficiently heterogeneous in this regard. Next slide, please. This is a busy slide, obviously. This is a trend in uh, drug use over the six months of the study, and it is difficult to identify any meaningful trends. However, uh, trends in reduction of the of use of cannabis, alcohol, medicinal methadone, and medicinal buprenorphine were statistically significant. Overall, participants used fewer variety of different substances at the end of the study if compared with um, a baseline. And the trend was also statistically significant. Qualitative interviews suggest that uh, there were difficulties in obtaining drugs, specifically in the beginning of pandemic uh, during the strictest lockdown period. Uh, uh, exceptions were medicinal methadone and buprenorphine, which were diverted from OST programs to note from March 13, all patients on OST received take-home dosing in Georgia. Many uh, individuals who use drugs switched to alternative substances when preferred drugs were not available, and particularly club drug users uh, reduced consumption of drugs due to closure of events. Uh, where they usually consume drugs. There are certain changes in markets. There were certain changes in markets, uh, and I will highlight them uh, um, at the end in conclusions. Next, please. This is a um, uh, slide showing sorts of uh, clean needles, and uh, there were observable increase in risk behavior, specifically in March, May. Uh, buying drugs in pre-filled syringes used uh, or using previously used uh, syringes or receiving used syringes from friends or partners. However, importantly, these risky practices were abandoned as soon as access to sterile equipment was restored. In terms of access to harm reduction services, uh, respondents reported that access to services was affected, again, specifically in March and May during the strictest lockdown. 
uh, due to closure or closure of services or reduction in working hours or difficulties with transportation. These findings are in line with uh, data from Georgian Harm Reduction Network, who is a, um, a major provider of services in the country. On the right side, you see that there was a dramatic reduction in HIV testing rates during the lockdown. However, access and utilization of services recovered, as I mentioned, as soon as lockdown measures were gradually lifted. Uh, this was a short report about our findings from a cohort study. Now, Matanga online market, and uh, uh, on a map you see four places where this major online drug market offers to deliver drugs which are bought from Georgian segment of Matanga. Uh, this is a technology for Matanga scrapping. We've developed custom software scraper which downloaded data from the site every hour. So that we had 24 files downloaded every day. A major assumption uh, during the monitoring, so we assumed that if product disappeared from a listing or amount was reduced, we considered that the product was sold. These are major findings. Uh, surprising to us, frankly saying, there were over the six months of monitoring from April, including September, there were <clears throat> about 1,300 listings offered by uh, 124 vendors. There were more than 22,000 transactions on Matanga, and we speak about Georgian segment of Matanga. Right, and overall value of sales exceeded 4.5 million USD dollars. We recorded 19 types of different substances sold on Matanga over this period, and cannabis accounted for the largest share of transactions and almost half of sales values. This slide shows cumulative total revenues on the left and number of transactions over the monitored period. Cannabis was leading. Cocaine was surprised to us. I mean, in both in terms of number of transactions and value was a second. Then methadone, ecstasy, and many other uh, uh, substances you can see. Uh, again, probably busy side. On the left part, we see monthly trends in transactions. Uh, I mean, uh, leading with the cannabis, and then if we remove cannabis, we see that uh, the month with the highest number of transactions was not anymore August, it was April and then May. To be noted here, we lost the website uh, for three weeks in the end of June. So we don't have that because it, it was migrated to a new address, which is probably usual practice for such kind of web pages. So we don't have data for these three weeks. Next, please. As this slide shows similar data, but in relation to revenues generated from the sales in uh, Georgian segment of Matanga, again, August appears to be the um, month with highest value. If cannabis removed, April uh, 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 now becomes the uh, month with the highest value of sales. Next. Uh, and this probably is the last slide uh, about Matanga. This is a unit cost, mean unit cost of different substances and trend in the change in unit cost. Uh, it's difficult to explain why unit prices for some drugs increased dramatically over the period of the study. Uh, for example, for alpha PVP or uh, methadone or uh, uh, methamphetamine and not increase for others. We don't have all the explanations for this trend. To conclude, 
uh, availability of drugs during the lockdowns declined and many individuals who use drugs switch to alternative substances. There was visible trend in uh, increased diversion of uh, opioid agonist uh, medications. Uh, many individuals who use drugs engaged in risky behaviors like sharing or obtaining a use of preloaded syringes. However, importantly, these risky practices were abandoned as soon as the access to sterile equipment and harm reduction services was restored. We, we believe that some uh, individuals who use drugs might benefit during the period of lockdown due to reduced drug use under the lockdown, probably most applicable to so-called club drug users. We observed important, very interesting service innovations like utilization of mobile vans, self-testing technologies, vending machines, and take-home dosing. So service providers were able to show um, enough flexibility in adjusting to new situations. Drug markets, which was uh, our one of prime interest, uh, were able to function probably without any remarkable disruption during the lockdown. And adjustment strategies included new places for drop-offs for drug home delivery, increased role of a middleman, and so on. And in terms of results on the price and quality of drugs, the results were mixed and uh, difficult to make any conclusions. Uh, that's it. Thank you for your attention. Happy to, uh, we'll be happy to respond to any questions. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you, David and Tatiana, for your uh, introductory presentation. We did receive uh, actually two, uh, three questions, I would say. We received a question, uh, and we are keeping receiving the questions, and uh, I will now um, uh, pose the two of them. Um, uh, which The question comes on which antihistamine, antihistamine products are used, and is there addiction on pregabalin in your population? And maybe David and Tatiana could briefly respond to that. Yeah, I can. I can respond regarding the Ukrainian situation that our main antihistamine uh, drug is uh, uh, dimidrol or diphenhydramine, and it is used also in injection. It is actually added to the opioids to the syringe directly to prolong the action of the opioids. And uh, especially during the pandemic, when in the beginning the prices a little bit increased, the people were using this uh, dimidrol and sanat more actively to prolong the action of the sometimes smaller doses they could buy of the opioids. And regarding pregabalin, pregabalin is um, available in Ukraine in the form of pregabalin and also Lyrica and Gabbana, and it is very popular, but mostly as far as I know, it is popular to use like in the morning to relieve the withdrawal system syndrome, as far as I know. Thank you, Tatiana. Is there anything Thank to you. add from uh, part of uh, uh, David? No, I, I think the situation is pretty similar in Georgia. We have a few other questions. One of them is what percentage of participants were retained over the duration of the study in each country? And also the participants would like to hear what were the rates of the COVID infection among people who use drugs compared to other people uh, in the population, if there are any data and if there are any overdose fatality. If you have anything to comment. Yeah, can I? Uh, okay, we don't have data on the prevalence of COVID among uh, people who use drugs, unfortunately. In our cohort study, 27 participants were tested for COVID over the study period and none was confirmed. We had two participants lost for follow-up, uh, only two, and overall the I mean, compliance was very good. We missed only 40 for zero sessions out of six. 
And Tatiana, any mm -hmm. comments from your side on this? Uh, as far as I know, the retention was very high. I think one person died during the study and all the other were retained. And we don't have data on the COVID prevalence in our cohort or in any other COVID population. Maybe Katerina Tevich from the Public Health Center can add anything. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. And thank you also for this nice introduction, because now we would like to go a little bit to the discussion with our panelists. And I already introduced our three panelists uh, uh, from Ukraine, uh, from Georgia and from, uh, from France. And uh, indeed, I would like to start with uh, Katerina, and I would like to ask her to comment. Uh, how would you comment on this study from your experience uh, and from your, your viewpoint? Uh, good day to everyone. Uh, many thanks to the presenters uh, because the results of the study are very interesting and have a great importance not only among stakeholders but also at the governmental level too. Uh, as a national coordinator of opioid substitutional therapy um, in Ukraine, I would like to add some points on how COVID-19 influenced the OST program. Uh, firstly, I would like to say that the COVID-19 epidemic has shown that the government can be flexible and fast in its decisions, and uh, it can um, be able uh, to um, uh, quickly respond to factors that may affect the functioning of the OST program. Uh, and when uh, on March 2020, uh, the uh, strict uh, quarantine measures were set in Ukraine, the government made the decision to transfer OST patients on take-home medication dispensing for up to 10 days, as uh, was mentioned uh, by previous uh, speakers. Uh, and. Um, for example, uh, on previous years, approximately 53% of OST patients were on take-home medication dispensing and started from March 2020. This number of patients uh, increased up to 80% and it still remains uh, at the same level. Uh, this such decision was quite risky for the government, but uh, such practice uh, really helped keep a high patient retention in the program. And also, um, according to our reports, there were no overdoses increasing on uh, OST patients on take-home dispensing. Um, Th thank you. Uh, uh, also, uh, just a couple of sentences. Uh, also, uh, I would like to say that um, um, despite the strict uh, quarantine, uh, there was a good setting of new patients to the OST program. And the uh, uh, previous year was the most uh, effective year since setting new patients uh, uh, to uh, the OST program, uh, and it was increased by almost 2,500 new patients, uh, despite the strict quarantine and measures uh, uh, on the territory of Ukraine. Yeah. Thank you. If you have probably questions by, uh, about the OST program uh, functioning, I will I am ready to answer. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Katerina. And now I would like uh, Ketevan to, to comment from the Georgian point of view. How, how do you, what are your comments on the results of this, uh, this uh, research and, uh, and how does it uh, uh, speak with your experience? Uh, thank you, Yuxa, for this question. And uh, first of all, good afternoon, everybody to the speakers, uh, to the organizers, and uh, the participants who are um, attending to this event. Uh, as of our understanding, it's more than 100 people listening now to us, and it's very uh, promising and um, very pleasant to hear that. Uh, thank you for having uh, this kind of webinar and giving us the possibility to be the part of this um, event to speak on behalf of Georgia and uh, Ukrainian experience. How did the COVID impact uh, the, the general drug policy. Um, I also want to thank to Tatiana and David for holding, uh, having this kind of um, cohort study, which is very important tool, not only for those people who 
um, are the um, the beneficiaries uh, or who might get uh, affected uh, from the study, but also for the uh, policymakers uh, and for the uh, people working on the drug policy in Georgia. Um, as you know, so far, we, uh, with the MCDDA, the National Drug Observatory in Georgia and the Ministry of Justice, uh, hold the similar transport uh, uh, study, uh, which was focused um, mostly on the uh, similar and same topics. How did the COVID influence on the drug users, the services and the drug market? And I just want to comment that the, the results uh, that we um, received uh, in uh, uh, March, uh, April period was uh, quite similar as David has presented and also Tatiana uh, in the context of uh, Ukraine regarding the uh, accessibility to the OST programs, the take home doses, which is quite similar that we have observed the number of the people has drastically increased. Um, and there was some um, obstacles in, in the beginning about the accessibility on the harm reduction services, but because of the uh, the good adaptation of the new reality, um, the harm reduction uh, services uh, and uh, the network managed to adapt the new reality and they were the study, they started providing the mobile um, services. Uh, beyond that, um, no, there were some other findings that this uh, transporter study has shown us. And by the way, this study is also accessible on the webpage of the EMCDDA and the Ministry of Justice, both in Georgia and in English. Um, we have also observed, and I'm pretty sure that it's also um, to some extent included in the, um, the cohort study that uh, Alternative Georgia and David uh, and the whole team um, uh, conducted uh, the um, uh, Using the uh, in injection, uh, using of the uh, drugs was drastically decreased. Um, and uh, on the second part, so I, I believe we will have the chance to talk about how we're going to use this study because both of the countries, uh, it's quite obvious and it's quite clear that we tend to uh, develop um, uh, the evidence based uh, drug policy and this kind of studies especially in the uh, time of the pandemic is very uh, important tool. And the findings that uh, the cohort study and the transporter study showed us will be um, the, the lessons learned for us that will be used for the further development of the national policy. Thank you. Thank you, Ketevan. And now we are going to Paris and uh, let's hear from the, our Retox uh, focal point representatives from Julien uh, how, this, how the results of the study resonant, re, resonate with your experience in, in France. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ilse, and uh, hi to everybody. Good day. Uh, it's a real pleasure to attend this uh, webinar. We, uh, we watch the first webinars, and it's a real pleasure to uh, to enlight what is done with the uh, cooperative countries of the EMCDDA and the EU4MD uh, project. So, uh, a real pleasure for me as a head of the National French uh, French National Focal Point, member of the RATOX, as you mentioned, and. Uh, well, we, we worked in France, uh, especially uh, during this uh, lockdown period in the, in the first part of the 2020. And we released different uh, publication uh, that you can find uh, in the chat, I think. Uh, two main publications, I think the first one, uh, which is quite uh, near the, um, the presentation we have, it's, uh, but different in the, in the methods. We, we have um, a network called TREND, which uh, means Emerging Trends and New Drugs, that has uh, celebrated its 20 years of, uh, of activity uh, last year. It's a monitoring system of uh, qualitative information uh, during, uh, eight, uh, for eight cities in, uh, in France. And we uh, made a special survey with our network uh, during the spring of uh, 2020 and uh, released two uh, uh, built-in of uh, information uh, and it's focused mainly and on problematic drug users so it's one of the points I, I, I will stress uh, just after a while. The second point is uh, quite interesting because we've made a web survey uh, you, know, you all know that uh, EMCDD has launched uh, a new web survey, a European web survey on drugs 
uh, in March, and we, we we test a web survey for um, cannabis users because in France, a main uh, the main industry drug uh, uh, use is cannabis. So uh, and opioids or cocaine is very uh, uh, very less used in France than uh, than cannabis. So we made a special survey on that cannabis online uh, 2020. You will find the result of this uh, survey also online. Uh, I will find. Well, uh, what, what's very interesting from these um, two studies, uh, I would find first uh, similita similar similarities, sorry, with France, and I think what uh, what um, EMCD has shown uh, the Redox um, feedback to during a uh, twenty. First of all, the similar is, is um, the isolation uh, the problematic drug users, as, uh, as they're called, people who have uh, very so, uh, a lot of social difficulties. And the lockdown uh, has um, uh, uh, caused an uh, intensification of these difficulties about housing, about uh, having some incomes. Uh, like, uh, like the, so it's one of the issues that you can find uh, during your, your studies when, when you get some social problems and you're a, uh, um, a drug users, you have you, you face more uh, problems during uh, a time of lockdowns. And uh, one of the issues. For that is that uh, practitioners services has, uh, has to adapt themselves uh, very much. One uh, main differences between uh, Ukraine and uh, Georgia and, and, and the French situation is that uh, in France since the uh, mid uh, 90s we have a, a very large access to uh, OST. Uh, I think that uh, if I'm correct, but uh, Alexi will correct me, that we are the most uh, the country with the most coverage of uh, OST for problematic uh, drug users and people who uh, inject drugs. So it's a uh, it's a situation that uh, has um, uh, limit the, the access of uh, to heroin, for for example, nowadays. And um, one of the point is that. Just after the beginning of the lockdown, uh, the public services, uh, public policies has changed uh, because um, uh, practitioners and uh, the people on the field uh, told them that you have to uh, uh, fa facilitate the access to OST. So th there was some uh, big change uh, to uh, the access of OST uh, to facilitate uh, the, the access of the, to the drugs, um, to the OST uh, medicines during the lockdown and it was one of the main change and the same thing for naloxone uh, to prevent uh, a period of overdoses so it was too ch too to change very uh, important in france at uh, uh, try to avoid uh, overdoses also that would be the one uh, some similarities and uh, with between ukraine georgia and uh, what we uh, when we find in france and the second one some differences thank you very much thank you julien uh, thank you very much for your insights, what, what has been done by your agency as well, and, uh, and uh, what, um, how, how does the experience of Georgia is comparable, Georgia and Ukraine is comparable, but what you saw in the, in the scene in France. And we have a second question for all of our panelists, and this time I would like to ask uh, to Ketevan, who actually already brought up the question. So, what's the future? How these type of the studies will inf influence the, the drug-related services and, uh, and also uh, in, uh, in, in general responses to drugs in future? Um, thank you, Ilza, for this question. I think this is very important to... Uh, uh, and shared question and topic for all the countries uh, because all of us were uh, quite heavily affected um, by the COVID and it has uh, showed us that something has to be changed. Um, and these studies uh, also confirmed that the, uh, the new reality does exist uh, and the responses uh, that we had before, it's quite uh, outdated for the, the new, new reality. Um, that was a good uh, year for, in terms of uh, uh, lessons learned uh, and uh, um, in terms of um, planning the new activities uh, and the new responses to the uh, drug-related um, challenges. Uh, for instance, when we were discussing and we like uh, um, analyzed the previous year, meaning the 2020, during the heavy COVID period, uh, we have um, one of the topic that was uh, 
identified was the um, uh, adoption of uh, the uh, new uh, instructions and guidelines for the service providers, how to react during the crisis periods like pandemic and the other global uh, crisis. Um, we uh, also, this, uh, this study that was presented by David and Tatiana once again confirmed that uh, the services, um, we should also be uh, ready uh, to provide the remote services to the, um, the beneficiaries because before that was not that uh, actual, uh, the, uh, there was not the necessity in that uh, scale as we had before. Um, Another thing that um, we think is uh, necessary to think, not only in the context of Georgia, but global wide is the uh, enhancement and again, adaptation of the rehabilitation and psychological services for the drug users, because these uh, services should also include some component, um, how to uh, provide the services uh, uh, in, during the pandemic and during the lockdown period, because this is another stress um, uh, for the drug users. Um, we have, um, and how we should uh, use those uh, uh, findings. Uh, obviously, uh, one of the best tools to translate those ideas in the future activities is the action plans. And quite recently, uh, the the Ministry of Justice and the government of Georgia has already adopted the two years action plan for uh, related to the drug policy in Georgia and uh, those new um, uh, like the ideas were um, uh, tr transmitted as the future activities. Uh, this is very natural, uh, but uh, how we see the using those uh, findings and uh, the challenges that we saw and analyzed during those uh, um, uh, findings uh, from the cohort study and also the transport, transporter study that we did with EMCDDA. Thank you. Thank you, Ketevan, very much for those insights. It's uh, it's great to hear that uh, that they, there are such positive changes already in Georgia. And now, uh, uh, Julien, uh, what what will change in France? Oh, what will change in France? No, I, I can I can't answer this question in less than three minutes. So I, I will stick to the to the subject and uh, and the topic of the webinar today, and I will be uh, shorter than uh, my first intervention. So because uh, uh, it's I think it will be interesting to to hear uh, the, the result uh, and the um, opinion of the researchers of our, on our comments. I would just say one of the main issues of the first lockdown and uh, the new normal we, we face since uh, last summer, because for us, I think there was a lockdown in the spring of uh, 2020 that was very unique, very strict for uh, in France. And then we're working with webinars, with uh, telework and, and, and so on and so on. So one of the main lessons is to, uh, to um, comfort, to cooperation, cooperation between all uh, the practitioners, the public services, to help and to, uh, to assist uh, people who, who need the uh, most of um, support. So uh, as uh, Ketevan just uh, mentioned, we, we also have in France a lot of uh, advances uh, in, uh, for the public measures uh, on arm reduction in France. And it's uh, very important to, to um, uh, have some uh, read, uh, good feedback of experiences uh, from the first lockdown. So it's uh, one of the uh, most uh, uh, main challenge in France that we're working with uh, feedback and lesson learned to, uh, to improve uh, arm reduction uh, in our country. And uh, I have a question uh, for, the, um, for the researchers. It's, uh, I was uh, wondering if uh, this um, cohort would be uh, followed uh, during all 20, uh, 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 during the year 2021, because I think one of the main uh, uh, issues for all of us is to find a way to monitor uh, this new normal. I, I know that Alexi uh, is very aware of that, but uh, and we are all in the retox 
how do we know to adapt our monitoring system to this uh, to this uh, new uh, new normal situation? And so I think it's very uh, very important to have a cohort and to follow this cohort for many months and years. So that would be uh, my last comment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julien. Uh, I will leave the, your your question to the researchers maybe after the last intervention uh, for for the end. Uh, where we will give floor to them. And now I would like to ask uh, Katerina in Kiev. So for you, for the opioid substitution treatment services in, in, in Ukraine, uh, will the COVID experience uh, change something in the service provision? Thank you. Of course, the uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, epidemic changed a lot in uh, functioning of OST program, as I told uh, before. Um, but um, uh, and uh, the results of uh, this study that was presented uh, has a great importance uh, to uh, move forward it uh, because it provides an opportunity to make uh, conclusions for the work uh, that was done previously in the previous year and uh, make the necessary adjustments for the future activities in the OST program and, uh, and the other governmental programs in Ukraine and not only in Ukraine, I suppose. Thank you. Thank you, Katerina. And now uh, going back to David and uh, also Tatiana, there was a question in the in the questions and answers about the policing, about the about the seizures. Is there any comments uh, uh, from your side, uh, David? I saw that you were already uh, responding to that question in written. And then the second question, then from from Julien, would there be uh, would you see the possibility to continue the observation of this? cohort uh, in, in both countries? And what, what are the needed, uh, uh, let's say, framework for that? Okay, to be short, we didn't notice or document any um, dramatic increase in seizures at that period, specifically even about specifically of methamphetamine. Uh, so we really do not have any uh, grounded explanation for such a um, rise in unit price of certain drugs. Uh, I sorry I missed the question about police. If you can tell me, uh, Ilse, I would be happy to respond. While I will uh, respond about the cohort, yes, of course, we asked all our cohort participants and uh, asked for permission to contact them in the future if similar studies are uh, implemented and we have this permission almost from all of them. Uh, we don't have yet any specific plan when and in which form this uh, might be done. David, uh, David, there was a question uh, regarding the uh, po police seizures or policing in the neighborhoods. Uh, I cannot see any more as well this, uh, the, this. Yes, policing, pol increased policing then, was yeah. there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. Uh, and that was partly reason for some restructuring in uh, drug supply, specifically when bought from Matanga and Simiral online market, you know, when drop-offs are hidden somewhere and then buyer is uh, um, receiving a photo or coordinates of the place. So these places to hide drop-offs moved often from the central parts of the city to suburbs to more quiet places where there was less police presence because police shifted its uh, attention more towards central and busy parts of the city during lockdown and it was more safe to hide those drugs somewhere in a distant location. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if I may to add regarding Ukraine, of course, the police presence in the streets was like increased during the, especially during the strict quarantine. And so some people reported they were happy to wear masks and that's why probably not only because of convenience or because medical methadone was cheaper than illicit methadone, people also felt and reported in the qualitative interviews that less criminal 
was involved in buying with buying um, medical methadone because they could be stopped in the streets and still not you know, be charged with anything. Uh, this is first, but we didn't hear about any like arrests or something like that. And regarding the overdoses, also the system of um, registration of overdoses is not ideal in Ukraine and we almost don't have access to this data. Uh, however, according to the community, drug user community representative, the number of uh, overdoses significantly increased, especially in May, June and July in Ukraine in different cities because our data is only regarding Kyiv city. And he thinks that this was because of um, decreased access to the drugs of choice. So people had to experiment with using new drugs and sometimes buying drugs, their stashes, you know, that you don't know exactly what you are buying. So he explains in this way why the overdoses number is, was increased. And the same actually reported the representative of the OAT site. He also said that they had the information in their colleges and that the number of overdoses, of overdoses increased, but it's kind of gray data. So this is not from the official sources. Thank you. Thank you, Tatiana. Uh, and uh, so we have exhausted our <laughs> our questions also on the panel. Oh, no, I see a few questions coming in still from the participants. Uh, we have a question from, uh, from uh, uh, Sam Friedman asking about the police corruption and demands for money from people who use drugs during these street events. I, I guess, I don't know if anybody has anything to add on this, uh, this topic, uh, if you collected any inside data from the uh, peer review, David? Yes, uh, thank you, Sam, hello, good to see you. Uh, we don't have any specific data. Uh, there were no any events that you know attracted our attention on, or no information coming from any source about changes in police attitudes or practice or way how they work and how they deal with drug users in general terms. I mean, this issue has been, uh, I guess, you know, solved in, in case of Georgia and Georgia police and you don't see anymore in Georgian street, you know, such uh, co corruption or um, any other violations of uh, drug users' uh, rights or, uh, I mean, exceptions exist, of course, but uh, as a rule, it, it's like uh, civilized uh, in, in this country. Thank you, David. So the questions are exhausted and, uh, well, I give floor back to Marika for the final words. And thank you all for the being together with us and presenting your experience. Thank you very much, Ilze, and all the participants for excellent uh, timekeeping. I would like to give the floor to our director, who always gives some inspiring, conclusive remarks. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you also for, to the audience for the interesting mm -hmm. questions arrived. Thank you very much, uh, Marika. I think you are too nice with me. Um, uh, well, uh, first, I would like to, to address special thanks to Tatiana, Katerina, Ketevan, Dato, and also to Julien. Um, I mean, if, if I think about the first contacts we had with your countries, uh, also in cooperation with uh, uh, Poland and Czech Republic, in particular our friend uh, Thomas, who was involved in the first attempts of the EU help establish uh, focal points and better evidence-based uh, policy. Um, I think uh, you, you made a huge progress against all odds, against plenty of challenges and difficulties. I think what, what is very interesting from what you present is that um, finally some of the, the impacts that uh, you have been uh, 
observing uh, following the beginning of the COVID uh, pandemic, they are more or less uh, belonging to the same categories of impact we are facing in the EU member states. The modalities may be different, but uh, are still there. Um, I think that uh, what, what, what I would like to, I have a few questions for, for the future activities in the context of the project, but I, I would like to, to locate them uh, into the context of uh, what we can do to, uh, together to prepare for the post-COVID-19 world and life, in particular in your country. So we have, uh, we are lucky enough that we have almost uh, between uh, one and a half and two years until uh, the end of this project. Um, certainly the project at the end will be very useful, probably differently useful than what we imagine uh, when we were planning it. Um, I, I think uh, there are very interesting developments. Uh, I, I see some of the questions that that at least uh, would be interesting for us to, uh, to understand a bit better. Um, I think, first of all, one of the things that are a priority, I would say absolute priority for us, is to manage to document the innovation and change in the interventions, whether it is for prevention, for treatment, or harm reduction interventions, that, that all professionals, all people from the field uh, who have been participating in the different surveys, web surveys, the webinars, they us uh, that uh, uh, th there is a need to keep some of those innovations uh, for the future of the drug policies in the in the countries. I imagine it's the same for you. Certainly, we are there also to help you to document this and to inform uh, whenever whenever it's need the the decision makers either at your national level, but also at the EU, EU member states level, you know that um, the, we want to use, as we did already in the past, to help the EU institutions to build on the data and the evidence, the analysis we provide together, to also help them to perceive what are your needs for support from the EU as there are different cooperative programs uh, uh, and fundings uh, supporting uh, the cooperation between the EU and your country uh, to, to help you to bring or to build the case about what are the needs. Uh, and, and when I speak about needs, of course, I don't speak only in terms of security and fight against organized crime, but also priorities in the area of public health. Uh, what, what I think is uh, one of the questions that we have all in common and we don't have the answer, I think it's, it's one of the key questions uh, uh, I would like to see how we can continue to work with you on that is to try to see what is the, the likely market changes that will last, that may remain, and what may be the, the potential impact on drug use. Um, and to tell you, we, we, one of the priority questions around those topics for us, also in the, the context of, of our work on the European drug market is to understand, for instance, how the increased availability for some substances like cocaine in the EU. What, how can we feel the, the impact in terms of use and the potential public health impact? Because um, there is always a time lag between the increase in the availability of some substances or the changes in patterns or the changes in the use of substances. And then I would say for some of those substances, the most severe health consequences may come much later if people just start or initiated use last year or for the moment. So, so it's, really, it's really important that we, we can help you and you can help us to understand and also to use this to raise the awareness of decision makers, both at the UN national level. Then uh, one, one of the questions, um, and I, I want of course to, 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 to thank and to congratulate uh, Julien and his team uh, for the publication on, uh, on the drug market uh, in, in Georgia. Uh, for, for me, one, one of the questions that we, it's not the topic for today, but that's a topic that I have in mind for you and us for the coming 18 months or for the 18 years is um, what, what, 
what could what is the likely impact on drug use in your country of what is happening maybe outside the capital cities because it is about the the coverage of osts or whatever the name we give in your to those programs in your country but both countries have uh, some difficulties in uh, in some regions in the country uh, in some border regions uh, what is the likely impact not only on uh, uh, drug trafficking and trafficking routes uh, but also on the modalities uh, and risk behaviors in your country i think that that's something for which uh, i would say any id any new initiative that we can take as we already started to do with this very interesting uh, 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 study that you presented that we could uh, launch and implement in the coming 18 months would be very important because again it's one of the things we contribute to break uh, for 25 years now since the mcdda and the retox focal points network have been established is to break this idea that uh, they are the kind of bad producing countries then there are even almost so bad or equally bad transit countries and then there are poor victim using countries now we are all equally consumers producers trafficking countries the eu is one of the biggest producers for some substances in the world and ex exporting uh, worldwide so how how can can we try to feel to give some hints uh, because basically one, one of the problems we are facing is uh, is the level of priority of drugs for policy making globally or nationally or even at european level and uh, there is this still old idea that every time we speak about drugs people keep the idea of the junkies injecting uh, heroin 30 years ago in europe the image is much more complex how can we uh, put flesh on those uh, on the skeleton how can we explain uh, better what's happening what's the likely impact and uh, what are the things we could try to help you in order to prevent more uh, foreseeable negative impact and then finally uh, I, I, i'm very excited to see and to listen to dato and the result of the study on the dark net because um, there is sometimes the idea that this kind of study is for very advanced country, very rich, because uh, in the others, they don't use internet or they don't have internet or there are no websites, nobody is using. And uh, well, maybe there was some truth in that two, three years ago. But clearly, the, the pandemic and the, the follow-up and the post-pandemic are changing the world much faster than we expected. And especially for those who are under 30 or even 25 years old, which is none of us. So we need to learn and, uh, and, and you have the tools, you have the capacity. And maybe, and that's my final word, I, I think most probably we, we should see together and explore how can we also surf together on this uh, acceleration of digital transformation to help you to bridge the gap I don't know Tatiana for so long time. I just met her today for the to, her today for the first time. But I know Dato and the, and the colleagues from Georgia for more than ten years, and I know you feel frequently that uh, it takes long to make change. It takes long to get better treatment. It takes long to have better service or more evidence-based policy. Today, I think we somewhere we have a chance to accelerate a bit. How can we use those tools and how can we, be, we at the MCDDA be more useful for you for that? Well, that's the question. And I'm looking forward for next webinar or for another meeting online or in the real life, even. We are still interested to meet you one day in the real life too. Uh, that will be the question we want to continue to exchange and explore with you in the future. Thank you very much.